uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, uh, what this is about, it's about knowing and seeing it. Yeah, knowing when you know and see, that's when you have the possibility of making progress on the path. Uh, and uh, what is interesting, knowing and seeing is something that is very common in the suttas that talk about, you know, knowing and seeing usually refers to the four noble truths. Uh, that's kind of a standard thing that we see knowing and seeing. Uh, um, and it can also be knowing and seeing can also be what leads to uh, kind of aversion, if you like, to the world, because you know that the world isn't really reliable and you turn away from the world, you turn away to the, towards the spiritual path. Uh, uh, but in this case, it's uh, quite a different way uh, of defining knowing and seeing. Uh, seeing uh, and here it says, uh, as I mentioned before, for one who knows and sees what? Uh, and the answer is proper attention and improper attention. Uh, so this is quite interesting. Yeah, I don't know if you, what, what do you think? But to me, this is quite interesting because it is a different way of uh, talking about the Dhamma and every time and the Dhamma is talked about in a different way. There is the possibility of expanding your understanding to get a more idea of what is going on there. So the Pali words here for proper attention is yoniso manasi kara. And the improper attention is a yoniso manasi kara. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, and so this is uh, very interesting. Yeah? Uh, and these words are very are very uh, important in the suttas. They occur in so many different places. Uh, and so we need to discuss a little bit about what these actually mean. Uh, and somebody just made a, made a little chat point there saying that the Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it wise attention and, and unwise attention. And uh, I, you know, either translation is fine, but uh, I think maybe wise attention gets more to the point of what these things are about. Uh, it's about thinking about the world in the right way. Yeah? It's about using your mind in such a way that you get closer to Nibbana, you, you, you move forward on the Buddhist path. That is really what it is about. So proper attention does not mean, you know, oh, you, you say to a child in school, oh, please pay attention, or please pay proper attention. It's not that kind of proper attention. It's proper attention in the sense that uh, it has a positive effect on your spiritual development. So um, uh, what exactly does it mean? Manasikara, Yogiso Manasikara, the word Manasikara uh, basically means something like the work of the mind. Yeah, manas is mind, kara is action. So the action of the mind or the work of the mind. And that is why it is translated as action, because it is how we attend. Yeah? It is how we, how we direct our mind in the world. Yeah? You will notice it is not so much about where we direct our mind. The way we direct is not so important, uh, but how we direct it is actually more important. Uh, so you can look at the same thing. You can look at it, at it in a good way, or you can look at it in a bad way. Uh, and it is how you actually, what kind of mindset, what kind of attitude you bring with you to the attention that is important. Uh, so attention is a is this idea of yoniso, it is where we are directing our mind yeah, and how we do that. Uh, and then the idea of uh, wise or yoniso, this comes from the word yoni. The word yoni means womb. Yeah? And uh, womb, the, the idea of the word womb is that it is the source of things. Uh, it is the origin, it's where things are coming from. Yeah, Kind of makes sense. And uh, so in a sense, you can say that yoniso, because it is about the origin of things, uh, the source of things, uh, it is about the kind of attention that goes to the source, that looks at the source, uh, understands causality, understands conditioning. Uh, why do things happen? Yeah, how do they come about? Uh, it is that kind of attention. Uh, and that may sound, I don't know if that, how that sounds, maybe that sounds very fancy and very kind of elevated and intellectual, but actually it's not very fancy. It just means that, you know, when you, you understand if you, what is the difference between metta and ill will, between loving kindness or love and ill will? Well, the difference is only how you attend to something. You can look at a person, the same person, and you can have ill will towards them, or you can have metta towards them, exactly the same person. And the difference is only one thing, your attitude. Yeah, how you how you uh, relate to that person in a sense. Uh, 
If you see that person as someone who is an aggressor, someone who is nasty, someone who is hurting you, whatever, then you will have ill will then. But if you look at that person instead as a person who is someone who is suffering in this world, someone who is conditioned to be the way they are, someone who doesn't have much choice, but they have to act out that conditioning in a certain way. If you think of exactly the same person in that way, you will tend to have compassion for the meta for that person. And that is so interesting. You know, there's a tiny shift in the mind, just the attitude that we bring to things is all it takes, is that entire difference between a wholesome quality that helps you on the path, that makes you feel happy, that makes you feel good about yourself, uh, and a negative quality which is so destructive, uh, both personally and for society and for awakening and for everything else really. Uh, isn't that interesting? It's a tiny shift in the way we look at things. Uh, it's sufficient to make all the difference uh, in whether uh, things are going right or things are going wrong. Uh, and it's something that we can all do uh, without too much problem. Yeah, it's not hard to do. And it's, it, I, I find it almost uh, strange that we actually need a Buddha in the world to take to tell us that you, uh, you know, all you, all you do is you, you look at the person in a new way. You have to understand them more in terms of. Uh, and the causes and conditions rather than in taking them to be some kind of being which is there and who are who is actually treating you in a bad way and the reason why it takes a buddha to understand these things is basically because even though on the surface surface it seems easy it is also very profound at the same time because to really understand the conditioning that we are under and the fact that we are really uh, just uh, you know, all the, our past actions in this life and previous lives, they are what that is what makes us who we are. To be able to understand that fully, you have you have to understand non-self, anatta on the Buddhist path. Uh, because the anatta insight is basically an insight about, uh, uh, you know, conditionality. We are the sum total of the forces that act upon us. Uh, we are not some independent entity that acts in the world independent of these external things. Uh, so that's why it is profound. Yeah? Even though it is obvious in one way, in the, in the highest sense, it is also very, very profound. So proper attention is to understand things in the right way, yeah? going to the root of things, understanding why bad things happen. And then improper attention, yeah? is Manisikara, is the exact opposite. It is when we look at people in the wrong way, we uh, look at them like an enemy or someone who is bad or someone who is or whatever it is. Uh, and all of that together uh, gives a rise to the defilement of the mind. And that is when we have a problem. So um, proper attention yeah, or wise attention. I quite like the translation of wise attention myself. So I, I agree with you there. I, uh, so that, that, that is a good point. Uh, so how exactly do we use this? Uh, yeah, how can we use proper attention in, the, in our lives? Uh, I always want to make these things practical. The suttas are practical. They are about practice. Uh, they are about how to move forward on the Buddhist path to make our lives better, more meaningful, more happy, less suffering. Uh, the same for the people around us. Uh, yeah, that is what it is all about. Uh, so it has to be very practical. So how do we use this proper attention in a practical way? And uh, the way it is used in this particular sutta is in a very high way. Yeah? You can see into the uh, next part of the sutta, you will see that uh, uh, what it is referring to is the uh, somewhat Okay, that's better. So um, uh, it is in this particular sutta, Yoni Somanasikara is used in a very high sense. And yeah, we're going to see that in a second, that it is all about uh, insight into the idea of non self. And it's very profound, but it's also very interesting. So I hope you kind of hang out for that part of it, because even though it is uh, profound, it also can, can has ordinary implications for us. So, that's how it comes out in this sutta. But Yoni Somanasikara 
is something that actually comes at the very beginning of the path. Yeah, if you decide that Buddhism is something that is uh, useful, yeah, you read the word of the Buddha, you feel inspired by the word of the Buddha, you think, yeah, now I'm going to keep the five precepts, yeah, I'm going to live well, I'm going to be kind to others, uh, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to even, even try to do a little bit of meditation in my life, maybe I will even read the sutta, and maybe I will come to Ajahn Brahmali's sutta retreat, yeah, so well done for being here, it's really <laughs> nice to have you all here. So that at the very beginning of the path, even when we start out, that is an instance of Yoni Somani Sikara, the very fact that you recognize the teachings of the Buddha as profound, as beautiful, as having the potential to enhance your life quality, yeah, and all these other things. That is itself Yoni Somani Sikara when you do that. So all of you already, you have Yoni Somani Sikara, otherwise you wouldn't be here. The point of being here, unless you thought it was going to do something good to you, yeah? So you're already on the right track. Yeah. So that is the starting point. But then as you practice the path, yeah, then you, you realize from the word of the Buddha that you should be, you should live well, you should be kind, you should have the morality, the seal of a Buddhist. Then. As you realize all of that, that too is Yoma Somana Sikara. Yeah? And uh, this is one of the areas where you can really build it up. Because one of the most difficult things of the path is to be consistently kind. Yeah, it is very hard to be kind all the time eh? in everything in everything you, you do, in everything you say, in everything you think, eh? in everything you perceive. Eh? How can you be kind in all of those things? Eh? And this is one of the areas that actually is one of the most difficult ones on the Buddhist path. Eh? But if you can purify that, eh? yeah, then your meditation is going to happen. And it's going to be so profound very easily because you... Uh, because you have that uh, right attitude of mind already here. And uh, the way to do that is to reflect on the dangers of morality. Here. So one of the aspects of proper attention here is to remember the dangers of being immoral, of doing bad things, uh, how it stops you from making progress on the path, uh, how it leads to your own suffering. Every time you do something wrong, you're taking one step back, yeah? Every time we do something good, we are into the rightness in our mind, own minds. Uh, every time, if you, if you look very carefully in your own mind, this is actually a very important thing to do. Uh, you will see that kindness uh, leads to a sense of lightness, of brightness, of joy inside. Every time you get it right, it lifts you up. Uh, yeah? You feel better about yourself. Uh, and if you can see that, then you also know every time you do something bad or wrong or unsuitable or immoral or whatever, uh, you let yourself down. You feel more dark inside, more gray. You lose your energy. You lose the brightness of the mind. You're dimming the lights inside. Do you want to have a bright mind? Or do you want to have a dull mind? Do you want to have a mind where you feel energized? Or do you want to have one of those sleepy minds that never has any energy inside? This is the difference. And every time you go wrong on this path, you're taking a step back. Yeah, This is what you need to investigate. And the more you understand this, and this is Yoni Soma Nesikara, proper attention, the more insight you have into the importance of morality on the path, uh, the more you will be able to affect it in your daily life, yeah? You think it is so important, it is so fundamental to your very existence as a Buddhist, uh, that you will never forget it, it will always be at the back of your mind, the back of your head somewhere, lodged as a kind of right view, stuck at the back of your mind, uh, yeah? This is really what it is about. And when that right view is stuck at the back of your mind, and every time you open your mouth, every time you do an act, you think, wait a minute, should I really say this? How can I say something that is kind? How can I do something which is even more kind than I'm already doing? How can I define my intention? How can I think differently? How can I look at this person in a new way? How can I perceive them in a new light by using the teachings of the Buddha? And as you are doing that, you are enabling the uh, using your Samana Sikara to uh, enable morality. Yeah, and eventually it becomes so strong yeah, that uh, you, you, you feel, you know, you don't want to be immoral even for a second anymore because you understand how dangerous it is, uh, how you let yourself down, not only yourself, but all the people around you. In fact, the whole world is being let down by these things. Uh. 
So this is the beginning of Yonga Soma Nisikana. You come to the teachings of the Buddha, you recognize them, and well done to all of you for having done that. It is not that many people in the world who recognize the power of these teachings. And then as you move on, you have more Yonga Soma Nisikara, you understand the importance of morality, and the more you understand that, the more you apply yourself. And, and then we can take this stage by stage. The next thing then is meditation practice. Yeah? If you look at the, uh, the way that uh, the path is explained, it usually explains, it starts off very often sila samadhi panya, so sila morality samadhi. In this case, can be called meditation if you like, yeah? and then panya at the other end. Uh, so uh, the next thing then is how do we use proper attention to help the wisdom practice? Uh, Sorry, not the wisdom, but I mean the meditation practice. And uh, here, one of the most important things is to use the similes of the Buddha to understand the obstacles to meditation. Yeah, what are the obstacles to meditation? Well, there's two, there's five hindrances in the suttas. But of those five hindrances, the most important one is the two first ones. Yeah, they're the ones that really matter the most. And uh, of those first two, first two, the most important one immediately is ill will. Because ill will is something that we want to reduce, yeah? And it is a big hindrance on the path. Uh, so one of the things we should always uh, try to do is to reduce the factor of ill will. We don't get so irritated and angry, etc., with the people around us or the world at large. Uh, so this is, and I will talk more about this later, because this is a very important part of the uh, Buddhist teaching. So. But the other aspect, and this is really the root problem, which stops us from all meditation practice, uh, and that is the karma chanda, yeah, the desire for the sensory world. Uh, and uh, that includes also the attachments to the vices as well. Uh, yeah. So proper attention in Buddhism, if you really want to let go of things, if you want to move towards meditation practice uh, and we want to uh, enable our mind to become peaceful and clear, this is what meditation is about, peace, clarity, happiness, all of these beautiful qualities. Uh, to be able to do that, you have to withdraw the mind a little bit uh, from the sensory world, uh, have less interest in that sensory world. Yeah? We tend to be far too interested in these things. Uh, and of course, the way to do that is very simple. Yeah? And it's, it's, a, it's a, astonishing that not everyone understands it. Because obvious, once you think about it, yeah, the whole world should understand it. Why isn't everyone a Buddhist? That's what I tend to ask. It. Everyone should be a Buddhist. And if you're not a Buddhist, then uh, it's almost like what went wrong with you? You're not a Buddhist. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? But there's only a small minority of people in the world who actually are Buddhist, even though to me it seems so obvious. And of course, the uh, reality is that the world of the five senses, uh, as I mentioned before, and I will mention this many, many times during this uh, short little retreat, is out of control. It is always changing. It is going to be unsatisfactory. It is always going to let you down. Yeah? And by this world of the five senses, I mean everything, everything that we have around us all day, from the world at large, the world we read about in the newspapers, uh, and the world that we see on television, uh, uh, that is the world at large, you know, or politics or whatever it is, or climate change, uh, to our personal world, the world of uh, our own bodies, uh, our families, uh, the place we live, our homes, our mother's country, whatever it is. Uh, all of that in the entire world uh, is really important. And the more you reflect on this in a wise way, yeah, it's important here to be wise about this. Uh, if you try to do this too fast, you might get really depressed and think, oh, this Buddhism is terrible. I have to give up all my happiness. But that's not the point. The point is just to understand the world as it is gradually as you are able to take it on board, yeah? not to become depressed. If giving up the world outside made you depressed, then all the arahants were depressed. Have you ever met any depressed arahants? There are not that many depressed arahants, right? Arahants have to be really happy. All the people that I meet in my life who are very inspiring and very magical and powerful and have a lot of metta, maybe they are arahants, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But they are not depressed. They are the happiest people in the world. 
and they are happy precisely because they have left, given up the world outside without control, and instead entered the world inside them. The, uh, the world of samatha, the world of samadhi, the world of happiness and joy and peace and stillness inside her. That is why they are happy. And that is why this is so profound. So when you do these kind of uh, reflections, uh, be gentle with yourself. Uh, know what you can take. Uh, don't go too fast. Uh, don't do things that lead to you know, depression or sadness. Uh, then you are missing the path. That is not what the path is about. Uh, but if you get it right, then you will be able to let go of the external world uh, and at the same time move into the inner world inside at the same time. Uh, and as you do that, you're getting the right balance. Uh, so this is uh, proper attention in the sphere of samadhi, yeah? knowing what to let go of, uh, knowing what is dangerous, knowing what is always going to be problematic for you, turning away from that, turning towards the uh, world inside instead. Uh, then, uh, as the last part, we have the uh, proper attention in the sphere of uh, um, wisdom, yeah? sila samadhi wisdom, and uh, this has a lot to do with uh, non-self, with the three characteristics here, yeah? anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, suffering, and self, especially with the idea of non-self. Non-self is like the, uh, the jewel of insights, yeah, this is the insight which makes Buddhism unique in the world. All the other things can maybe be understood to some extent, but non-self is kind of the most profound thing here. So we're going to look yeah, in quite a bit more detail later on on the idea of uh, non-self and how to pay proper attention in respect of non-self. So uh, that gives you an idea of proper attention. Yeah? The scope of this is so broad and so large. It's such a, uh, such a marvelous, uh, marvelous thing. Yeah? And it's something that can be all the way from the beginning of the path. Uh, because it is called wise attention, it is very closely related to wisdom. Yeah? It arises out of wisdom. It also arises out of the suttas. Uh, there is one sutta that I often do on my retreats, not on this one, but I often do. It is called the Avijna Sutta which some of you may recall is from the Anguttara Nikaya Numerical Discourses, the chapter on tens, number 61. And in the Sutta, the Buddha, you know, some of you may remember this, the Buddha, he starts off by talking about uh, Vijja Vimutti, yeah, knowledge and liberation, yeah, profound knowledge and liberation. Yeah. And then he starts from that and he says, well, what is the cause? What is it that makes knowledge and liberation possible? These are the highest aspects of the Buddhist path. Yeah? Knowledge and liberation, that's arahanship, where we're all kind of hoping to move down the track. So what is the cause for that? Then? What makes this possible? And the Buddha's answer is the seven factors of awakening. Yeah? Seven factors of awakening, they are all about meditation practice and all about samadhi practice. So samadhi is really the cause for knowledge and freedom. And then the Buddha asks the question, what is the cause of the seven factors of awakening? What makes that possible? And it says the four satipatthana, yeah, the four mindfulness meditations, if you like. Yeah. What is the cause of that? And then he goes back stage by stage. Yeah. And around factor nine, I think it is, maybe nine, uh, you find yoniso manasikara. Yeah, yoniso manasikara is a factor, so let's, let's go backwards. We have a, uh, the, the, um, uh, the four found the four uh, mindfulness meditations. The cause of that is the three kinds of good conduct. Uh, the cause of that is uh, sense restraint. The cause of that is uh, a mindfulness and clear comprehension. Uh, the cause of that uh, is, uh, I think, I may, I may get this a bit, bit mixed up, I haven't looked at this for a long time, but I, the cause of that, I think, is uh, Yoniso Manasikara, what we're talking about now, yeah? So Yoniso Manasikara, in this case, comes quite early. So what is the cause of Yoniso Manasikara? And the Buddha says, faith. Yeah, faith is the cause of Yoniso Manasikara, which is very strange. What is the cause of faith? Listening to the Dhamma, yeah, the true Dhamma. What is the cause of listening to the true Dhamma? 
seeing the noble ones, uh, yeah, seeing people who are Aryans who have understanding of this. Uh. So what this is saying is that uh, the cause of wisdom, the cause of attending in the right way is faith, faith in the word of the Buddha. It, this is interesting, isn't it? This is one of those very interesting things about the Buddhist teaching that the a very strong connection between faith, or we could call it confidence, confidence may be better, very strong connection between faith and wisdom. These two are not really disconnected in Buddhism at all. They're just two aspects of the same coin. If you have very strong faith, that usually comes from wisdom, yeah? unless it is false faith, it doesn't, it doesn't count as faith anyway. If it is real faith, it comes from wisdom. And if you have real wisdom, then what that means is that you also have faith because these things come together. So um, the, these things, yeah, so faith and wisdom are actually very, very closely connected to each other. Uh, someone just asking the title of the sutta, the title of the sutta is All the Defiance. Yeah, it's the second sutta in the paper, is it? can't see it because we're focusing on only one small part. So all the defilements, we are uh, two or three paragraphs down very early on in that sutta. So, yeah, so this is the, uh, so this is what is, uh, uh, what is fascinating about this, yeah? So initially, our Yoni Somanasikara, it comes from the word of the Buddha. The Buddha says, attend in this way, uh, this is how you're wise. This is how you are unwise. Yeah? Think about people in this way. Yeah? Think about people as suffering beings in the world who don't know what they're doing, who are walking around in darkness, uh, deluded, not understanding what is going on, acting to their own detriment, uh, not really what is appropriate. Uh, and once you start to think about people like that, uh, compassion and metta will arise as a consequence. Uh, yeah? This is what the Buddha tells us. Uh, Think about the world of the five senses as problematic, yeah, as a, a debt, as a uh, borrowed goods. I will come back to these beautiful similes later on because they're so powerful there, and they really start to change your attitude and how you think about the world, yeah. And uh, then we apply those teachings in our own life, yeah. This becomes Yoni Somana Sikara that we get from the Buddha, and as we apply them, we start to internalize them. They become part of our own wisdom. And as they become part of our, our own wisdom, they actually start to become more powerful as well. So this is the, uh, this is uh, how that uh, wise reflection, wise attention gradually develops over time, starting from the word of the Buddha and then gradually becoming your own inner power that you use in your own life uh, to uh, understand and to develop further. Uh, so this is uh, Yona Samana Sikara as, uh, as, a, as a factor where it comes from, uh, how we then develop it over time. Yeah? And very closely related to the idea of faith and confidence. Uh, yeah? This is very important. Uh, wisdom is important. Proper attention is important. All these things really work together and now you can probably also see why wise attention is so closely related to the Four Noble Truths. Yeah? I said before, for one who knows and sees, what does that mean? And usually that means seeing the Four Noble Truths. But seeing the Four Noble Truths is very similar to seeing a proper wise attention or unwise attention. It's almost exactly the same thing, because when you see the Four Noble Truths, what do we understand? Well, you understand Dukkha, the first noble truth is all about suffering. And if you understand the suffering and understand how that suffering is caused, it means that you will tend to attend wisely, yeah? Because you know where suffering is, you will attend away from the suffering and towards the happiness. If you understand that the world of the five senses is problematic and suffering, you will no longer attend to that world in the same way. Yeah, this is kind of the power here. This is why this is so powerful. So, um, uh, so proper attention is very closely related to the idea of the four noble truths, because you know where Dukkha is, and straight away you know how to uh, guide your proper attention in the right way as a consequence. 
So what may have seemed very weird in the beginning, yeah, why is one who knows and sees what, why is that proper, why is that wise attention and unwise attention, hopefully now it makes a bit, bit more sense to you. Now. The other thing here is that uh, one who knows and sees, yeah, if you know and see the four noble truths, uh, one of the things that you have overcome is doubt. Yeah, Bitsha Kiksha, we'll see this later on as well, uh, has been overcome. Because you know what the Buddha's teaching is about, it means you cannot have any doubt anymore. Huh? Because you cannot have any, any doubt anymore, because you know what is good. And doubt in Buddhism means, uh, lack of doubt in Buddhism means that you don't know what is wholesome, what's unwholesome. Huh? You know how to apply your mind, you know what is negative and what is positive. You know what teachings work in the world and what teachings don't work. Because you know that, it means that also you will attend properly as a consequence. Yeah, and That proper attention comes from understanding the wholesome and the unwholesome. And then guiding your mind according to what is healthy, wholesome, that gives rise to happiness in your life. So uh, that is a lot about proper attention right there. Uh, and uh, I hope that makes sense to you. I hope you can see a little bit of what I'm talking about. Uh, personally, I find this very, very interesting because this is almost at the very core of what these teachings are about. Yeah? Knowing how to use your mind in a skillful way. Uh, knowing how to guide yourself so that you can always improve on the spiritual path. Uh, if you can do this, then you are really, um, really going very well now. So uh, that is what ideally we should be, we should be doing here. Um, yeah, some of you have been asking some questions. Uh, if you can please hold those questions till uh, 3.30, and then we can go through them all at 3.30. So just keep on putting them in there if you like, it, and I'll come back to those questions later on. Then. So, uh, yeah, fascinating, isn't it? Isn't it kind of cool? I, I, I love this stuff, because this really is uh, the essence of what these teachings are about. And if you can get a feeling for this, I think you're going to make massive progress uh, in spiritual practice, because... Uh, um, very often, you know, we complain, we meditate maybe year after year, we don't really make the kind of progress that we want. Uh, and very often, this is where the problems arise. We're not really using our attention in the right way. We're not kind of using this opportunity to think about the world in a way that actually works. Uh, yeah, and then we're going to be uh, on the right path if we do that. Uh, so please consider these things carefully. And again, as I said, please continue asking questions about these things. And then comes uh, the very interesting uh, thing here. And uh, um, this is, uh, uh, we are there. The, Okay, so the, the problem is, uh, Bobby, I'm not sure if you can hear me if you're around, if you are not there or not, uh, but uh, whoever is a BGF webmaster, yeah, is that Bobby? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm... The text is, yeah, great. The text is partly covered on the screen. Is that how it's supposed to be? Or uh -huh. maybe I just need to minimize this. Hold on. Okay, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I can, I can work with it now. That's good. Yeah. Please go back up again, Bobby. That's, that's good. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so um, um, then the next thing it says here, yeah, we're going very slowly now, but it's really worthwhile going slowly because all this is very nice and very useful. Huh? So one who knows and sees what? One who knows and sees wise attention and unwise attention. When you pay unwise attention, defilements arise, and what's arisen, they grow. When you pay wise attention, defilements don't arise, and those that have already, already arisen are given up. So this is almost like a definition of wise attention. Yeah, If you uh, know that you are paying wise attention, 
you know that if your defilements are going down. So at this moment, if you are looking at something and, and you are looking at that in a way which give rise to desire, then you know that there's some defilement there. Yeah. Uh, but if you're looking at the same thing and you just feel a sense of peace or equanimity and it doesn't bother you, then you know that it is wise attention. So you can tell, or if you get angry with somebody, yeah, you will know straight away that there's something here that is unwise. I'm looking at this thing in the wrong way. Why? Because my defilement is arising. Yeah? And then you keep looking at this person and because the anger is there, oh, it becomes even stronger. Yeah. Once arisen, they grow. Again, you know that you have a, a defilement there, something uh, you have been using improper or unwise attention. That's why the defilement is arising here. So um, this is, the, if you like, a very general uh, definition of wise and unwise attention. Uh, the fact that they uh, give rise to defilements. Uh, if you do unwise and they let go of defilements, you, you uh, give them up if you use wise attention. Uh, so it is very, very useful and it gives an idea. Yeah, you can think back, you can, okay, I was using, I got angry. Why did I get angry? Uh, what, what, why, what kind of unwise attention was I using? How was I thinking about this person in the wrong way? Yeah, and then you, because you know that your attention was unwise, and you, I assume everyone probably wants to be wise. Yeah, wisdom is a marvelous thing. And you ask yourself, what went wrong? What should you do differently? Yeah, how should you attend to the situation in a different way? And then, uh, uh, yeah, or you see uh, something beautiful that you'd like to do, or something marvelous, you get a lot of attachment or desire for something. Yeah. Then again, you um, uh, you uh, ask yourself why are you getting so attached? Why are you have so, so much desire for something which actually might not be all that useful? Something which is going to let you down in the in the long run. So that is a, a general definition of these things. So now, um, yeah. So uh, that is that. That is the. Uh, Function to this particular sutta, and uh, that kind of gives you a lot of background uh, already. Now, the sutta itself, uh, and this is what is coming next, gives us seven ways of giving up these defilements. Yeah, and all of these seven ways are very interesting, uh, and we're going to go into all of them. We have quite a lot of time over the next uh, today and the next three days, uh, so we're going to really get into this, and you're going to uh, have some idea what is happening here. So the student says that some defilements should be given up by seeing, some by restraint, some by using, some by enduring, some by avoiding, some by dispelling, yeah, and some by developing. So these are the seven ways in which we should give up these defilements. So let me just talk about this very uh, briefly now, and then we're going to go into detail of these things later on. Uh, so defilements to be given up by seeing, uh, this refers mostly to the idea of becoming a stream entry or seeing the Dhamma. And then when you see the Dhamma, you, um, you defilements obviously are, are given up at that particular point, and we shall see that uh, soon. Uh, but, uh, you know, every time you have a little bit of insight, uh, every time you see things more clearly, you understand the world in a better way, in a clearer way, it can be argued that, that already, uh, if you look at your mind at that time, there will be less defilements in your mind. Yeah, when you have more clarity, there will be less defilements there. Uh, so seeing will always be helpful in giving up the defilements. Uh, so any peace you can have, any clarity of mind, that that you have will be very, very beneficial in this way. But uh, this is a large part of what the suit is about, and we will uh, we will look at that in more detail very soon. Then we have defilements that should be given up by restraint, and uh, these are the uh, you know things that uh, uh, you can see that you, for example, that maybe some desire or ill will or whatever. Uh, is about to arise in your mind, and you can see that something unwholesome is kind of coming, 
they're looking at something or you're tending to something unwisely. <laughs> and you can feel that happening. And when you feel that happening, you can shift your attention around, yeah? And you can then think about a thing in a different way. Yeah? That is what is meant by restraint here. Yeah? I mentioned before that very often people think of restraint as something to do with willpower and force. That is not what it means here. Yeah? What it means here is to be wise about things. Yeah? We're coming back to the idea of wise attention again. Yoni Somanesikara. So when you see something negative about to happen inside of yourself, you ask yourself the question, wait a minute, am I really looking at this in the right way? How can I change this? Yeah? You don't have to think all those thoughts, but sometimes this happens automatically and then you change your attention. Yeah? You think of Bobby, I, I know you are out there, Bobby. You think of Bobby, you think, uh, what a marvelous thing it is to have such good companions in the whole life. I'm sure sometimes Bobby does things that irritate you. Sometimes I do things that irritate you, yeah? no doubt, uh, because this is what it is like to be in this world. Sometimes we irritate each other. But then when we remember the big picture, and yeah, we remember the good qualities are there, you can let go of that even before it arises properly. And that is really what is meant by giving up defilements by restraint, using the wisdom power as, as much as we can. Some defilements are given by using, and uh, this means this is a uh, uh, in this sutta it refers to uh, monastics using their requisites in the right way. Yeah, using the requisites not to. Uh, kind of be proud or to have the best requisites or the most expensive. You know, when Ajahn Brahm always jokes about having Gucci robes or, or Versace or, or uh, Armani or whatever. And uh, it is not just a joke. Yeah, sometimes monastics do get into kind of having this, not, 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 Armani, not kind of designer robes, but having uh, robes of, uh, you know, a certain type or a certain kind or having all stands in a certain way or having this or that. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the requisites we have become a matter of pride, yeah? something we use to indulge. Uh, and then they become a negative thing. Uh, requisites should be used only, and we look at this soon, only to um, be useful to us, to make our life practical, to make our life easy, and uh, so we can get ease and we can enjoy the spiritual path. Uh, and of course, this can also be extended to lay people as well. Yeah, for everyone who is listening here, uh, the idea is that we all are owners of so many things. Uh, so we should ensure that we use that ownership, use those things in a way that ideally supports our spiritual practice. Uh, and I will talk more about to do how to do this later on. Uh, then you have the defilements that are to be given up by enduring it. And this is just the recognition that there are things in this world that have to be endured. Yeah, it's uh, one of those uh, negative things about the sensory world. There are always going to be painful things, negative things in that sensory world. There are going to be people who say bad things. There's going to be pain in the body. I was going to say there's going to be pain in the backside. There's going to be pain in the backside as well. There's going to be pain in the body. And um, there's all things in the world we can't control. Yeah, we just have to admit it is out of control. And anything that is out of control have to endure. Sometimes it is too hot, sometimes it is too cold. And if you haven't got the right clothes or, or whatever, then you've got again you have to endure the climate and the things around you. So this is the idea of enduring. Then there are the defilements uh, to be given up by avoiding him. And so uh, this means that uh, uh, we don't put ourselves in a situation where we have to endure. Yeah, if we can avoid it, we should avoid it. We should not create suffering in our lives. Uh, and sometimes I know too many Buddhists who are too keen on creating suffering. Uh, please don't create suffering. Yeah, I, like, I always like to say there's enough problems in life already. There's enough suffering. I don't know about you, but I have enough suffering in my life. Uh, I'm, I have a pretty good life. Still, I have enough suffering. Yeah? If you ask Ajahn Brahm, I'm sure he too will tell you that he has enough suffering. He doesn't want any more suffering. So we are all in the same. We don't want to make the spiritual path problematic and, and suffering. Yeah? We want to make it something happy. So we avoid whatever we can. Then we have the uh, defilements to be given up by 
and dispelling it. And dispelling here uh, is very closely related to the idea of restraint that we saw before. Uh, sometimes the restraint doesn't work, the defilements come up, and if the defilements are there, then we have to dispel them. Yeah? So these are the arisen negative thoughts, the arisen negative intentions. Uh, once they arise, you have to somehow try to get rid of them. How do you dispel these things? And the answer is that, again, that you don't use willpower. You don't force these things out of your mind. Maybe sometimes you do, but generally speaking, you don't. You try to be wise about it. And I will show you later on, in some standard suttas that I like to read out, how the Buddha himself, or before he became the Buddha, how he used his uh, 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 wisdom uh, to overcome the negative qualities of mind. Uh, then uh, we have the last category. The last category is uh, uh, the defilements to be overcome by uh, developing. Yeah? And uh, these defilements are the uh, seven factors of awakening, uh, the Satta Sambhojanga. And they are called factors of awakening because they lead to awakening. And what are they all about? They are all about meditation practice. You have the seven uh, bhujangas, the seven factors of awakening that start with the sati factor of awakening, the mindfulness factor of awakening, the sati san bhujanga, and they go through this beautiful process of meditation. Yeah, All the various happinesses, all the tranquilities of the path that and then the second last one is Samadhi Sambhujanga, yeah, the, the stillness factor of awakening. And the very last one is the Upeka Sambhujanga, the equanimity factor of awakening. Yeah. So the seven factors of awakening that show you the path of meditation, starting from mindfulness and leading all the way up to Samadhi and all the steps in between that. Yeah. And uh, this is some of the most beautiful teachings on the entire Buddhist path, uh, because that meditation path, yeah, it's a path that has, it's all about happiness, uh, it's all about joy, it is all about tranquility, it is all about peace, uh, and it leads to this remarkable, powerful stillnesses of the mind uh, that you find when you get this body at the very end. Uh, it's very powerful and very uh, beautiful. And uh, so we will look at that in more detail uh, when we come to the very end. Uh, and uh, it, it is a very important part of the uh, Buddhist teachings. So these are the seven types of defilements. Yeah? And uh, what I would like to do now is I would like to look at how those, uh, uh, how the seven, sorry, the seven ways of overcoming defilements, how this compares to the Noble Eightfold Path. Because as I mentioned before, all of these things are uh, belong together. Uh, yeah. So uh, if we can go down the page a little bit, please, uh, Bobby, that would be great. Uh, let's get that table table in view. Yeah, that's great. That's perfect. So this is the table, uh, yeah, and it shows you the yeah, how these go together. So the uh, defilements to be given up by seeing. This is equivalent to right view. Of the Buddhist on the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, and it is also the first uh, factor on this, this particular sutta, so they kind of matches very well. Um, then we have uh, the next five, which are the defilements to be given up by restraint, by using, by enduring, by avoiding, and by dispelling, and this is all part of right effort on the path, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, because all of these things are in a sense come under that. For example, restraint is often called semi-restraint, and, and uh, dispelling is uh, the second aspect of right effort, you have the giving up of negative qualities that have arisen. And the two in between, the three in between, are also on that theme, yeah? How to use these things in the, or endure or avoid in such a way as to avoid the defilement. So, and then the last one, the, uh, as I mentioned already, the defilements to be given up by developing, this is uh, equivalent to the last two factors on the Noble Eightfold Path, right mindfulness and right stillness. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Samma Sati and Samma Samadhi. 
So you can see here, the sequence is basically the same. Yeah, this is what I meant that all of the teachings of the Buddha, they fit together. Yeah, they are not separated in any way. They're just different angles of the same teaching. Yeah. So in that sense, it's very kind of exciting. Yeah, it gives you the different angles. You get an idea of what is going on there. Now, what you will notice here is that in fact, the Noble Eightfold Path, the factors two, three, four, and five are missing. Yeah. yeah? And of course, two, three, four, and five, that is, first of all, it's Samma, Sankapa, right intention. Yeah, this is the first thing. Yeah. And then it is all the factors of morality, right uh, speech, right action, and then right livelihood. So why is that missing? Yeah. And uh, the reason why it is missing is because the, in the sutta of all the defilements, we start with seeing. Yeah? And seeing is usually here understood to be stream entry. And because we start with seeing, it means that all the factors of morality, they have been perfected. This is what happens when you become a stream man. You perfect all the factors of morality. So because they are perfected, they are left out in this particular sutta. Yeah? This is almost like seeing the path from the point of view of stream entry and how you then practice on from there. Yeah. So this, this is the reason why it is not mentioned here. But the, uh, that, it doesn't matter. Maybe you think that we are kind of aiming too high, but not really, because even though these things are uh, missing, and even though it is quite high, these can also be understood from a more ordinary point of view. Yeah? It is not just stream entry. All of these things also have an aspect to them that relates to everybody here. Uh, but uh, that is why they are not included. And that is why this way of uh, um, presenting the Dhamma is a bit different from the Noble Eightful Path. Uh, but uh, what I want to do, uh, and uh, I would like to go very briefly, go through all the ideas of morality before we uh, get on to the next section of this particular sutta, the Sabah Sutta. So I'm going to do a detour, and I will, I'm not going to get into it now, but in our next session, I'll get into a sutta called the Mahatratanisaka Sutta, the Majjhimanikaya 117, uh, which talks about the factors of morality. And it talks about that in maybe a slightly different way from what you are used to. So we'll do a detour into that sutta, and then we will come back to the other factors of the Sabasava Sutta, the one we're looking at here, we will come back to that later on, uh, once we have gone through the more basic uh, morality here. Okay, so um, I will uh, stop there for now, uh, because uh, uh, I think that is a suitable place to stop, and I've been talking a lot already, maybe probably too much, too much. Uh, let's have a short break and, uh, and please uh, uh, do whatever you like in that break and we'll come back again at 1.45 in about, uh, what is it, uh, just under 20 minutes, 18 minutes or thereabouts. So see you back again at 1.45.